Hi, welcome to the screencast for uh, topic 16 or option E on environmental issues. And I'm going to be looking at sections 3 and 4 here. Section 3 looks at the greenhouse effect and climate change. And section 4 looks at ozone layer depletion. So the greenhouse effect is naturally a process that happens and a good thing. Um, the Earth receives energy from the sun in the form of ultraviolet radiation, which is fairly high energy. And some of that energy is absorbed. Some is uh, a lot of the sunlight that we receive is reflected right back into outer space, but some of it's absorbed and then it's re-radiated or reflected back into space as a longer, lower energy wavelength called infrared radiation. And there's a natural balance between the incoming and outgoing energy that keeps Earth's temperature at a steady state or balance. And there have been, you know, if you look historically over thousands of years, you see there have been some, you know, increases and decreases. You talk about the ice age and other things. But the greenhouse effect that you hear so much about today occurs when certain molecules in the atmosphere have a covalent bond that vibrates at the same frequency as the infrared radiation. So they're able to absorb the energy rather than letting the infrared radiation escape. And that increases the air temperature. And again, we've always had some greenhouse gases in the atmosphere doing this, but the greenhouse effect or the cause for concern is now we have more of these gases with this covalent bond that absorbs the infrared radiation. So more and more energy is being trapped or reflected back to Earth. And so I've kind of um, already talked about this, that the greenhouse effect does occur naturally, but what we usually use it to mean is it's referring to the increase in this effect caused by human activities and that's caused by an increase in these gases of carbon dioxide, water, CH4 methane is actually a big one, CFCs which have been banned, um, ozone, N2O and SF6. The two big ones by far are CO2 and methane and CO2 um, abundance is absolutely the increase in abundance absolutely due to human activity especially burning fossil fuels, whether for transportation or burning it for heat. CH4, um, it's, it's occurring because we have more and more farming going on and that's where methane is primarily produced is um, as a byproduct of farming. And because we have six, almost seven billion people, we need to farm more and more. So, I mean, it's due to human activity, even though it's a natural source. And methane is actually far worse than the CO2. CO2 only has two double bonds. CH4 has four bonds. So one methane molecule can absorb twice as much energy as a CO2 molecule. So um, what are the effects of this increase in CO2 levels? <clears throat> Well, there certainly is no agreement on it, but people are beginning to agree there's definitely some climate change going on, regardless of where you want to place the blame. And climate change is a much better word than global warming. Um, we're seeing an increase in greenhouse gases that can change the global warming, but more significantly, it causes changes in the climate and so that might mean more snow, snowier winters in some areas, less than others. It's having different effects on different parts of the globe. So um, global warming is a little bit too narrow. Climate change is a better word for it. So we're seeing melting of polar ice caps and glaciers. We're seeing rising sea levels from the melting of the polar ice caps and glaciers. We're actually seeing a much greater increase in sea levels just because of the expansion just that small increase in temperature makes water expand a significant amount. And when you're talking about something as big as the oceans, that's a lot of expansion. It's causing drought in other areas, increased rainfall, changes in ag agriculture, and definitely changes in the plants and animals that grow in different areas. So the prediction is that an uh, area like Minnesota will, you know, at some point in the future, have a t uh, climate much more like that of Mexico and as you get further north in Canada is where you'll see climates, uh, seasonal changes more like what we're used to currently. How long will this take? Who knows? A lot of arguments about that. Um, there's also a thing called global dimming, which is kind of the opposite of 
greenhouse gases. It's the idea that less sunlight is allowed in to Earth. And this happened in the 1960s when there's a lot of volcanic activity. So there's a lot of soot in the air. We've had uh, some summers where it's real um, kind of hazy in the Twin Cities because of forest fires out west. This is the type of stuff in the air, these particulates, that can actually block incoming UV radiation and cause a drop in temperature. So Again, there's a lot of complex things happening with the environment, and to be able to pinpoint exactly what's causing what changes is very difficult to do. Ozone depletion. Ozone depletion is something that I remember hearing a lot about when I was in high school and college. Um, we don't hear so much about it anymore because we feel like we have it under control and the ozone is repairing itself. But oxygen um, in the form of O2 is very important down here in the troposphere where we live, but ozone O3 is also very important. It's found in the stratosphere above us naturally. Actually, when it's found down here, um, if you've ever smelt, um, if you've ever been at bumper cars and you kind of smell that, or if you feel like you can smell rain or lightning in the air, that's actually ozone you're smelling. And in the troposphere, it's considered a pollutant because it irritates our respiratory system. But up in the stratosphere, it's very necessary because O3 has a single bond and a double bond with the three oxygen. So it has resonance between that single and double bond. So both the bonds in ozone are weaker than the double bond in O2 is. And the high energy of UVC rays um, is enough energy to break the O2 bond which then forms the ozone, and that goes on up in the stratosphere and keeps that very high energy UVC from reaching us. We have UVA and UVB rays that get as far as the troposphere. UVC would be very harmful to us. Um, when you go tanning or when you're out naturally tanning, either one, it's the UVB rays you're concerned about because they have more burning potential. And UVC would definitely be dangerous, so that gets filtered up out in the stratosphere, and that's because of the O2 being converted to O3. So the natural formation of ozone is much like the halogenoalkane process where the high energy UV breaks the O2 bond and that forms these two free radicals. Remember with um, the halogenoalkanes we were looking at chlorine or bromine being broken into two free radicals. Same thing happens with the oxygen. And then the two free radicals now are available to combine with an O2 molecule and form the O3. And that process, of course, will be very quick. So our rate limiting step is this one here where the UV rays have to break up the O2. But again, um, that happens pretty easily. And then ozone is naturally removed when O3 also can be broken, one free radical broken off, leaving O2 behind. And then um, the O2 reforms when another one breaks off um, and O3 combines with that free radical that was made and breaks back down into, there should actually be a two here, two O2 molecules. Let me see if I can get that on without too much trouble. Let me pause this and take care of that. You'll notice that both reactions in the natural removal of ozone um, don't require UV light. So they're exothermic processes, which is why the layer above us, the stratosphere, is actually warmer than the top of the troposphere. You know, as we go up in the mountains, we notice it gets cooler. But if you went high enough up into the stratosphere, there actually is a rewarming up there because of this ozone process going on. So the problem was when we started using CFCs as propellants and aerosols, and nitrogen oxide is another one, but CFCs were definitely the big one that led to the decomposition of ozone into O2. Um, the CFCs can form free radicals, much like the halogenoalkane process, and then they both are replenished during the decomposition. That's where that whole free radical and propagation goes on. That one free radical reacts to form another free radical, so they act as catalysts. So it's that same series of steps of initiation, propagation, and termination. Since their discovery in 1930, there's been a buildup of CFCs in the atmosphere, and there was a corresponding fall in ozone levels. 
Again, they were used a lot in aerosols, refrigerants, and air conditioning because they're low reactivity, they're low toxicity, and they're low flammability in the troposphere. What we didn't realize is that they would get into the stratosphere and have um, really disastrous consequences. So because they are so have such low reactivity, the CFCs hang around forever and make their way up into the stratosphere, and then the higher energy UV can cause them to break down and start this whole chain reaction. So why is ozone important? Again, it protects us from the really high energy UV, particularly the UVC. So a reduction in ozone, um, we can expect an increase in skin cancer, more eye damage, uh, especially cataracts, even blindness, damage to plant cells where the growth and photosynthesis are being inhibited, they're more susceptible to diseases, and it also can affect the food and oxygen available in oceans and make oceans less able to absorb CO2. So IB will expect you to know a couple of these. The two easy ones are just think about humans. What happens with more UV, skin cancer, eye damage. So what are the alternative to CFCs? Well, the Montreal Protocol back in 1987 called for the phase out of CFCs and most countries have phased out the CFCs. So even though CFCs were phased out before you were born, they're still going to hang around into the next century uh, because of their low reactivity. So they're up in the stratosphere, they're going to do their damage, and there's really not much we could do about it other than not putting any more CFCs up there. So the alternatives need to have similar properties like low reactivity, low toxicity, and low flammability, but not be able to produce the free radicals. So um, this is a tough thing to come up with. So they've come up with alternatives that get close, but to get all four things, uh, the low reactivity, low flammability, low toxicity, and no reactivity, no free radicals with UV light, we're close, but not quite there. So hydrocarbons have hydrogen instead of chlorine. They don't decompose like CFCs, but they're flammable. So that's not the best thing to be using in an aerosol. Fluorocarbons aren't flammable, and the CF bond is too strong for the UV to break, so that's a pretty good alternative. Um, hydrogen CFCs, or what we call HCFCs, still contain chlorine, but most of the atoms are destroyed down here in the troposphere, so they don't reach the stratosphere. So the H, uh, HCFCs are considered the best option at this point. Let me just add there. HCFCs uh, because there's no chlorine and they're not flammable. The big problem is that regardless of which of these options you go with, you're still making more greenhouse gases, so there's another issue there. So that is it for sections three and four on greenhouse gases and ozone depletion.